So Jones just told us that a risk measure should in some way be an expression of our risk preference, and he's talked about management being consumed with various things. Um, but we should dig a little bit more into well, what, is a, what is a risk preference? What do, we, what do we actually mean by that? And we typically think of rational actors and rational people as they prefer more to less of a good thing, right? It's not, 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 not possible to have too much of a good thing. And we prefer certain things to uncertain things. Right? Probably everyone, uh, given, given a choice, you would prefer the certain bet to the, or the certain amount to the, to the bet at the same respect. So these both sound straightforward, but as we start to dig into them, they're maybe not quite as simple as, uh, as they sound. Even preferring more to less, right? Because when we think of preferring more to less as individuals, we typically have this idea of diminishing marginal utility. If I give you a lot of something, each additional unit is worth less and less to you. Eventually, you know, I can only deal with if I've got a 2,000 square foot house and I get a 3,000 square foot house, that's a, that's a big improvement. And then 4,000, maybe all the kids have got a bedroom of their own. And, but the difference between 20 and 21, I mean, who cares at that point? Right? And it's possibly even diminishing, mar decreasing marginal utility if you've got a heat and what have you. So that's one issue we've got. And the other issue is, as you think about utility, it's always relative to a current wealth level. Okay, so. If I'm a millionaire, an extra thousand bucks is, is one point, but if I've got no money at all, a thousand bucks might be the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it's not an absolute measure. And you know, a lot of economic theory is based around dealing with utility. And when we start to talk about companies, it all falls down because companies don't have diminishing marginal utility. Right? Companies don't say, oh, we're making enough profit now. We, you know, we, can, <laughs> we can just coast for a while. No, I'll make more profit. There is no decreasing marginal utility accruing to profit. You want to make as much profit as possible. So a whole theory that's based around an idea of diminishing marginal utility is not well suited to corporations. And, you know, and utility, that is inextricably part of it. Another issue we've got on the, on the preferring certainty to uncertainty piece is risk is such a slippery character, as, as, as we all know, right? You've got process risk and parameter risk. You've got the difference between uncertainty and ambiguity, you've got pure risks, which are an insurance risk, which is I can either lose something or be at an equal point, or speculative risk, which is an asset risk, where hey, I could go up or down, like those two are, are kind of different things. And then as we try and do all of this risk modeling nonsense that we're going to get into, there's an issue of when you model an asset, you typically regard the asset value as positive, so bigger is better, and when as actuaries, we take a somewhat unique view of things and we tend to model losses as positive, so bigger is worse. Okay, and that means that my percentiles switch around and it causes a whole lot of stupid and when you read the papers, you know, it'll it'll cause some confusion until you remember what is uh, what is what. This is a bit of an artificial confusion. Alright, so Don said a um, a risk measure quantifies our risk preferences in some way. And we, what we're thinking of here, as he said, is it's some function is going to take some random outcome, which we're thinking of as a random variable x, it's going to boil it down to a number, and I'm very simply going to say, I prefer x to y if the risk measure, whatever this risk measure is, is less than the risk of y. Okay, that's going to be my answer. And it's simple, it's consistent, it's easy to apply, I can think of it as applying for pricing, capital, whatever I want to do. Okay, and this is what we're going to study now, is, is these risk measures and, and various problems. So uh, as we went through this, uh, one uh, thing that we debated a, a lot in, in internally as we were preparing for this was you've got this idea of risk measures being used to determine capital, and you've got this idea of risk measures to be being used to determine pricing. And these are somewhat two different uh, views. And uh, in particular, we were sort of struggling with, okay, if I use T-bar, tail value of risk, it kind of gives me one very conservative view of risk. And the implications of that for pricing are I very quickly just want a full limit loss on any leg. Well, we know we don't price like that. We price at some sort of percentage of, of the limits. So how do we kind of square that circle? And what we realized was there's, it's not a, a, that's weird. I have a title on my slide and you don't <laughs> have okay. a title. Is it on the ceiling? Okay, so the title says <laughs> risk measures, <laughs> did I bend this, this, uh, is it? <laughs> There we go. Okay, thank you. So it's risk measures with a, with a bold S, right? There's two risk measures. They're going to determine what's going on. So if I've got an insured who's got the risk and they're thinking about 
bringing it to an uh, intermediary insurer, and it's an intermediary in the sense of it's an intermediary between the insureds and the investors, nothing to do with intermediaries like Aon and uh, other brands. Um, we have a regulator sitting there who typically tells the insurer how much capital they need to hold to bear that risk. Okay? And they have got one set of, they do not want the insurer to fail, they don't want to be required to come in and take the company over and pick up the pieces, so they take a very conservative view of risk, and they'll typically use something like a value of risk in you know, Solvency 2, 99.9%. <laughs> the good old Swiss, the inconsistent use tail value of risk, I don't think anyone else does. And they, they're going to tell the insurer, you need such and such a level of assets in order to bear this risk. And, you know, this is simplified, but this is basically what's going on. So that's one risk measure. The other risk measure is then between the sort of investor and the insured, intermediated by the insurance company, and that's saying, okay, I now need to raise this amount A, dollars, to bear this risk. How am I going to split that between premium that the insured is going to pay and some amount of capital that the investor is going to contribute? Okay, so we're going to have a different pricing risk measure that's going to be used to perform that split for us. And it's going to give us, you know, the premium will come in, the equity that the investor contributes with where the equity the, the uh, investor is basically buying the residual interest in the company at the end of the period, and they're doing that for the amount of assets required minus the premium. So that determines the split between the two. So we'll spend a lot of time. It's helpful to keep in mind here that there's always two um, risk measures going on, one market risk measure and one regulatory risk measure. All right, so I want to now uh, talk about, okay, so for determining pricing, how can we uh, think about using uh, risk measures to determine pricing? And there's a very helpful trick here that, like, Christened the thin layer trick, right? So pricing, uh, uh, even on something like a log normal, is a very hairy business, right? A log normal, a log normal distribution is not determined by all of its moments, right? It's not determined by its meaning. If, if I only know, I can know all of the moments of a f distribution, I can find a log normal that fits to that, and I can find a different distribution that fits to it as well. Very complicated, okay? So the simplifying idea is let's not try and bite off, let's not try and do the whole Python, let's look at one spot and price one spot and then add up the prices of the bits. And the joy of this is that if I'm dealing with a very thin layer, I'm writing an excess of loss for you that's one dollar excess of a million, let's say, I can characterize the risk of that layer with one number. It's just the probability that the layer attaches. Because that, that can, there's not going to be any partial losses. Right? If, you, if you insist, we can do one cent x a million, but let's just imagine we only pay you know, dollar losses. I can completely characterize the risk of that event simply by knowing the probability that it attaches. Okay? That's, and it, that's basically the only risk that you can do that with. Okay? Any other risk is going to be more complicated, and, and you're going to need more descriptors. So what we're going to need is some way of taking that probability of attachment characterization of the risk and linking it to a price. I want to be able to price one dollar x of anything and then I add up those prices and I can price any layer. Right? And I can price a quota share, I just do it from zero to infinity or I can price an excess layer. It's going to give me the solution. Okay? And we're going to call, you know, we're going to go, the, the languages people call it, it's exceedance probability or probability of attachment or expected loss, which are all the same for a thin layer with no partial losses and it's going to uh, have a price which we'll call either the rate online or the risk adjusted or distorted probability or the state price density. So we're going to have this thing called a distortion function. I don't know, maybe we decided not to call it a distortion function. I didn't get the email, so I apologize for that. Um, the distortion function is going to map me from my probability, my little layer attaches, and it's going to give me the price. Okay, so it's going to be a function from the probability that my layer attaches is going to be a number between 0 and 1, and my price has to be also a number between 0 and 1, because no one's going to pay more than a dollar for cover that only recovers a dot, right? It has to be less than or equal to a dollar. So I need some function from 0, 1 to 0, 1 that's going to price out uh, risk, and it should have, if we're risk averse, the price of the layer should be more than the probability it attaches, right? So that I've got some margin in there for the investor that I need to Okay, so how do we go? Oh, that's a scary thing to have on that. Let's, let's talk about it before we show up. How do we go from this distortion function to think about pricing? Okay, well, is that, this is, looks scary, but it really isn't too intimidating. 
So we are all used to simulating losses, and what do we do to take the expected loss? We just average them, right? That is basically what this says. So the P is my loss that I'm simulating. F inverse is a normal quantile inverse to get the loss from the random number. Right? So this you can think of as random simulation of losses, integral average. Them, okay? This is one way of thinking about expected value. We can also do it as outcome times probability, second way of thinking about it. Or we can do it as this is our survival function. So the great Lee, hopefully there's a number of people here who read the Lee paper, which they've tragically taken off the syllabus. <laughs> and so this is, this is saying that for each dollar, S of X dx is my probability I pay that dollar. So if I add all those up, I get the expected value. Right? So there's three different ways of looking at expected value. So how does G play into this? Well, I'm going to distort things. So this is my probability I pay the layer. I've just said the price of that layer is g of s of x, right? So g of s is greater than s, so this quantity is bigger than this quantity. And then if you do, this is just a uh, degree, what is this, substitution or something? An integration by parts, where I, I do the integral here and I differentiate this, I get this becomes my adjusted probability, and this is my outcome. And then this, the var and the f inverse are the same thing. Oh, I gotta use this. Thank you. I, this becomes my adjusted view of risk. So this is my measure of cares or cares more. Okay, so when we get to the cares and cares more function, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be the derivative of this distortion function, g, that we have. All right, so what do some of these look like? Or well, what's the, the net result of this? This is, a, this is our Lie diagram. You're possibly used to this thing the other way around, right, where people have 0, 1 on the x-axis, and this is the amount of loss that we simulate. So this area is my expected loss. This is my integral of S of X. For each loss amount, I increase, this is S of X, this is G of S of X is a larger amount. This difference in here is my profit component. And then this piece of out here is the extra capital that I'm needing to raise. And I'm assuming that my sort of policy is backed by some overall aggregate limit here is like two and a half million dollars or something. Okay, so those are the three pieces. All right, so what should this relationship, I mean, I've got stereo going on. <laughs> what should this uh, relationship between risk and price look like? We've said it's a function from probability of attaching on the x-axis to the cost of the layer or the risk measure on the y-axis. Well, one thing you could imagine is it, it might look like this, right? That at the zero end, there's no risk because there's no possibility of a loss, so I don't charge anything there. But at the other end, there's no risk either, right? Because it's a certain loss, there's no variability, so there should be no charge there. But remember, we're trying to get to the price. So we need to, this, is, this would be maybe an appropriate picture for just the risk load portion, but we're actually trying to add in the expected loss portion as well. So we need to kind of add the diagonal to it and end up with a picture like this. So we're gonna be looking for some function. It's always gonna start at zero, zero, because the price for no, no loss has to be zero. It's always going to end at 1, 1, because the price for a guaranteed loss of 1 has to be 1. And it should be above the diagonal line, because people are risk averse. And then it should also be below the top, because no one's going to pay more than a dollar for a dollar's worth of cover. Okay, so that's sort of our, our constraints. This is somewhat it's a service distracting. Okay. Um, sorry, I have a tension span of a nap, so. <laughs> <Just, laughs> um, all right, so. We're going to show you, I think Jesse will go through, we've got some data points. They tend to all be clustered at the low end, which is a bit of a problem because we want to fill in the, the whole curve. Um, we, we decided that we want our answer to fall into this upper triangle, but there's a number of sort of more subtle things that we, that we want to have, right? So could pricing look like this, right? Where, or wacky pricing. Well, no, this wouldn't work for pricing because you could do arbitrage games where you'd say, okay, if I'm going to write, you know, if I can sort of sell or I can buy this layer at this price, but then I could turn around and sell this smaller layer for this price and I could sell this layer for, you know, it would be like a negative price. This wouldn't work, right? This wouldn't give me a sort of sensible arbitrage free uh, overall set of pricing. So we, we need the function to be a straight increasing function in order for it to make sense as a market solution. So increasing is going to be the requirement for the risk measure to say, if x is more risky than y, the price of x is going to be higher than the price of y. Second thing we want is it should be concave. So this has got the little kink at the left-hand end. And you can show if you've got a price function that looks like this, 
it won't respect diversification. It won't give you a risk measure that's sub-additive, and that, you know, we, we definitely want that to happen, so we want something that's gonna look like this and be a, a, a concave uh, kind of a solution. Now, we can't have jumps, right? We can have a situation here where it jumps just at zero. It's the only place you can have a jump because it, we need it to be concave. There's no other place you can put a jump and have it be concave. And it doesn't have to be differentiable. It can have kinks in, and it can certainly go up to one at the top, and it can fit there. But we're, we're, we're left with a lot of flexibility. It just has to start at zero, zero, has to go to one, one, has to be increasing, and it has to be concave. So in the words of the great philosopher, with great flexibility comes great responsibility, and we can choose in many ways. So Jesse, over to you to tell us how to make that selection. 